So the discussion tonight is formulaic web design using wireframes and style tiles. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of cool things. Um, while wireframes and style tiles are the two main tools in which we'll be most focused on, uh, but there's a lot of theory and there's a lot of data that's going to be extrapolated through this presentation. Um, we're going to be going through it a little quickly. Um, we're a little limited on time. Uh, so know that if you need to take notes, just let me know if I need to go back a slide. Um, but also know it's being recorded, so you can, you're also welcome to go back and uh, <coughs> review it later. So, cool. Let's go ahead and jump right in. So what is formulaic design? Formulaic design is not a scientific term. It's just a phrase I'm using for this particular presentation. When I first got started in web development, I began as a coder. I started going into programming and coding in the sort. And while I obviously did transition into design, um, I very much appreciated the black and white aspect of coding. And that's not 100% perfect. I mean, we've all written really sloppy code and, and have it work and be, okay, don't touch it, it's the next project. Uh, we, we've all been there. Um, but there's less of the black and white scale in, uh, in design than there is in programming. So in design, it's not that it works and it doesn't work. It's more of like it works, but this could work better. And my goal tonight is to focus on the what is better and teach you some basic guides, some basic guidelines to follow and make the better design the standard base of your design skill. So what is formulaic design used for? Well, it's used for a bunch of things. Um, it's good for rapid development. Uh, we used it pretty thoroughly and fluidly during the WIMP Gives uh, meetup about six months ago. Tina and I uh, worked through style tiles pretty fluidly. It's great for low innovation projects. Most of the projects we have are not going to be like these super exciting, thrilling uh, objects and thrilling websites. It's going to be like, oh, I got another plumber website again. All right. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a great base to have for your current design. So my goal here is to teach you a base fundamental course. And then for your particular workflow, you can, ba you can uh, bend it and mend it and transition it to better suit your scenario. So. Um, let's do some housekeeping really quickly. How many of you guys are Mac users? How many of you are Windows users? Okay, so like 30% Windows. And how many of you uh, consider yourselves designers? And how many of you consider yourselves developers? Wow, totally even crowd, very cool. So there are points in the conversation coming up in about 20 minutes uh, where I'll be asking <laughs> developers uh, their opinion. So feel free to speak up at that point. So where do we begin in the design process? So we're talking about wireframes and style tiles most specifically. But I do want you to know that we are not at the beginning of the design phase or beginning of the website phase. So the main thing to notice is that research and mock-ups come before and after wireframes and style tiles. So we're sort of in between those two. I'm assuming because of this that we already have a few things. We already have our research done. We've already got a content strategy. And if it's not a formal content strategy, we've at least looked at the content, know what's going on, know what we have to design around. And I'm also assuming that the client doesn't have any branding currently. Uh, while full-scale branding applications are great, um, it's not usual for a client to have the budget for a full-scale project like that. So chances are 90% of our projects are more rapid development, quick, um, effective websites that don't have a large budget to go with it. Also note that I put mood board under research. Now, a lot of people like to put mood boards under design, um, under the design phase. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you place it. Just know that mood boards come before wireframes. And whether you want to put that in the design phase because you're then passing it on to the designer, it doesn't really matter. Just know that it's before wireframes. So speaking of mood boards, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, we're not really reviewing mood boards terribly closely tonight. But this is an example of a mood board, albeit a particularly fancy one. Um, <laughs> most mood boards are spliced together really rapidly, and that's totally OK. In fact, I would probably prefer that. Um, for those unfamiliar, a mood board is just a general theme of how one might view a particular mood. So the goal here is to say, hey, these are all images that I've stolen off the internet. These are not ones you've created. These are all images that I've stolen that imply a particular theme or mood. 
if you were to look at this, you could probably suggest other images that go with it, like a, like a lumberjack with a scraggly beard. Uh, that would probably fall in line with this pretty easily. There are also a couple colors down there that you can play with. Um, but the idea is just to give a, an incentive of theme. And where's a great place to find mood board material? Pinterest, our, our favorite social media. Um, Pinterest is by far a great tool to use for this particular project, specifically because most of the work has already been done for you. Uh, if you were to Pinterest a particular project you're working on, so say you're working on, uh, I don't know, um, like a bicycle tour of some kind, you could go into Pinterest and find a bicycle tour. <coughs> you could type in those keywords and see what Pinterest gives back to you, and then you can use those images for your mood board. Uh, if you're really into mood boards, another one is thematboard.com, which is more focused on design, but Pinterest does have a plethora of, uh, the yeah, thematboard.com. But Pinterest does have a lot of... Uh, Cool stuff on there. Also note that I just Pinterest, Pinterested uh, mood board. So now we have an inception moment where we have mood boards inside of Pinterest, which is a mood board. <laughs> so Leonardo DiCaprio would be proud. Inception? Bad joke. <laughs> cool. So those are my, that's just a quick overview of mood boards. That's not really what we're talking about tonight. Uh, we're talking about wireframes. So. Uh, we are going to be creating one of these tonight. We're going to be doing a quick demonstration uh, using a program called OmniGraffle. But the general idea of a wireframe is that you are only representing layout while doing a wireframe. There are a couple rules attached to that, mainly that you don't want any hint of mood whatsoever. So that means no colors, no images, just layout. You don't want to imply any sort of theme with layout. The idea is just to have the client focus on layout What's more hierarchically important than something else? Neat. So with that said, let's see if we can hop into OmniGraffle. And I'll sit down. My tea is still scolding hot, <laughs> so I can't drink it. Now, one thing I want to mention is that my goal is to not teach OmniGraffle. It's a large application. Somebody on the Facebook group mentioned that OmniGraffle is sort of the Photoshop of wireframes. And I think that's a pretty good uh, representation of OmniGraffle. It's got a lot of stuff, which means its learning curve is a little tough, um, but it's got some cool things. So let's see if I can go ahead and switch there. And I've got one open. I want to go ahead and close this. I want to open a, one up from scratch. So this is OmniGraffle at its base level. Now, one thing I want to consider is, and this is something many designers differ of opinion on, I've always considered wireframes to be a print document, not a web document. And I like that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is you're going to send them to the client, and they're going to print them up. They're going to pass them around to the team, and they're going to print them up, and they're going to write notes on it, which is great. I would actually prefer that. If you were to email a client a wireframe and have them open it up in their whatever preview application they're using, mm -hmm. Uh, they might call you up and they might say something like, you know, I like it, but it's really small, and you have to explain, no, it's just the, uh, <laughs> just the preview that you're opening up in. And if you print the documents, they don't have any of that. There's none of that false information. There's none of that confusion. So I actually prefer to think about wireframes as print documents. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and open up a letter landscape document. Cool. And this is what OmniGraffle looks like at its base level. So one thing I want to mention is that OmniGraffle is not a wireframing application. OmniGraffle is a diagramming application, which has its pros and cons. But let me demonstrate to you really quickly. Let's go ahead and create a very basic sitemap, nothing terribly fancy. So I'll draw a box, and within that box, I'll say home. So now we've got our first level. But if I were to duplicate this and go for our sub pages, and this one will be about and if I were to draw a line between those two, this particular entity now has a relationship. So if I were to drag this around, you can see they are connected. And on a similar note, I can actually grab my diagramming tool, which is this guy up here, and I can create several more hierarchies below it. I'm going to say this one is our services page. Here is our blog. Let's have a blog. <laughs> and here's our contact. And that's our site. Not terribly exciting. But now let's say that this is kind of ugly. We want to organize it a bit. So let's go ahead and we'll have OmniGraffle do the job. We'll organize that. And now we're thinking, hey, you know, under about, or rather under services, I'm going to have service one. And we're going to go ahead and create service two. 
And we'll draw a line between those two. And we'll go ahead and lay that out again. And if that's particularly ugly, we can go ahead and choose a particular diagram style that we like. These are all a little bit hokey. But the idea is just to represent that this is not a wireframing application. It does diagramming very well. And it's also not web-specific. If you want to lay out your floor plan, for example, <laughs> you're, you're welcome to use OmniGraffle. Um, cool. So that's just a rough demonstration of a site map. Let's talk about wireframing. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And I'm also going to turn off auto layout. That's what was uh, transitioning all my stuff around for me. I don't need that right now. Cool. So let's go ahead and do our overhead really quickly, just to confirm that everything is smooth. So this is a particular project. I wanted to choose a client that was real. This is not a fake client. And because of that, it doesn't perfectly fit within the lecture. There are some flaws or some problems with the client here and there. It doesn't smoothly transition into this workflow. So uh, this particular client is a dentistry consultant. Um, and his name is a little bit long. It's Performance Oral Surgery Practice Consulting is the name of the name, is the name of the business. So we'll go ahead and do a POSPC for short. And this is the home page. Cool. And then we'll go ahead and put something on the right side. And we'll say version 1.0 and today's date. Cool. Now our bases are covered. So something that OmniGraffle does well is the concept of stenciling. And this is where the rapid development of wireframing comes into play. So here are a bunch of stencils within OmniGraffle. I can go ahead and select anything here and drag them inside my document and edit them on a whim. But there's something in particular I'm looking for. Let's go ahead and grab our browser. So I'm going to drag a browser in here, and it's a little large. Let's cut that back. Neat. Cool. All right. So let's go ahead and start building our wireframes. The first thing I want to do is add a navigation menu. I'll just do link. And instead of making multiple links, I'm going to make this a table. I'm going to go ahead and drag that out. And after that, let's go ahead and place a hero image at the top. There's our hero image. Now, notice that I'm not being pixel perfect with my wireframes. Wireframes are rapid development tools. They are not to be spent a lot of time on. And let's go ahead and lock our background so we don't accidentally move that around. Now, earlier I said that there is no, that you, one does not use color or any imagery in your wireframes. There's a couple exceptions to that rule. One is the logo. I do want to place the logo in here. Let's go ahead and place an image. Where are my assets? There we go. Logo. Neat. You guys are so quiet. Am I being really boring? No. no you're doing super interesting. Oh, ah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's our logo. And let's go ahead and place a three column layout down here. Ah, oh, yeah. And now one of the other advantages OmniGraffle gives us is the ability to have smart guides, if anyone's familiar with uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. And they do a decent job. Let's see if we can turn those on and see if we can use those to our advantage. And it's not perfect, but it'll do. Cool, so we've got our three column layout. Now let's also go in and add some dummy text in there. It's not exactly lore mipsum, uh, <laughs> but it's, it is what it is. So. There we go. Auto link up the uh, side for me. Now it's overflowing, so I want to turn that off. Neat. And then we'll place it on this side. Hey. Cool. So now we've got our home page built in OmniGraffle. I know it's a lovely website. Super, super cool. Uh, now I want to go ahead and do something a little fancy to OmniGraffle. With my navigation menu up here, I'm going to create what's referred to as a shared layer. Um, if you're using Illustrator, this would be referred to as an embedded file, which Photoshop CC now supports. I'm going to go ahead and drag my navigation menu 
inside my shared folder. So this is more or less a smart object or a linked layer now. So if I were to duplicate the first canvas and create an about page, and don't forget housekeeping, this is now the about page. And we don't need, well, let's see. We'll have a nice header up here. We don't need all of this stuff. Let's keep one of those. And here we'll throw about. We'll center it both horizontally and vertically. And we'll throw in just another image there on the right side. Now, see that this is coming in orange. That means it's part of the shared layer. Don't need that. I'm going to drag that back down. So because of this navigation menu is a shared layer, I can do something fancy where if I were to extend this and create a bunch more links, the home page mimics that alteration. So if you have a wireframe with 80,000 pages, this will be super fancy and super helpful for that. <laughs> cool. So that's a quick demonstration of OmniGraffle uh, for wireframing. Anybody have any questions on anything I did so far? Do you have a Windows alternative recommendation because it's a Mac only tool? Mm. Yeah, OmniGraffle is Mac specific. Uh, I don't have an educated answer. Mr. Klosek, you were referring to another uh, wireframing application, right? Uh, there's a bunch of them, really. Yeah. I happen to use Sketch, but it's also a Mac only app. Ah. Get a Mac. <laughs> Actually, I've used um, mockflow.com, which is it's a web tool, and so it, it does a lot of this stuff. I've done the same, basically, what you just did. I've done a mockflow. Mockflow? Say it again. Balsamic? Yeah. Balsamic. Balsamic. Gotcha. Nice gotcha. Yeah, but this kind of stuff, like, like you said, this is not resolution critical. I use Sketch because it's a, it, it goes between wireframing and final design. But it's all vector, so I can output PNGs or SVGs or whatever. Nice. And it goes all the way through, so I can start here, and then if it gets approved, I just build on top of this. I don't huh. have to transition to another that's tool or redo any of this work. Okay. So cool, that's man. why using a more advanced tool is helpful, but it depends on the workflow. So a lot of people don't like to send their wireframes to clients, and I would highly encourage you to do so, specifically because wireframes are dirt cheap. They are so easy to manifest. If you, were to, if you were to send this to a client and he were to say, hey, I want to make this particular alteration, you can do that really quickly. Should you have gone into the design or coding phase, that alteration would have been much more expensive and costly for the client. So, Now, where the, where the developers go? I asked, uh, <laughs> nice. Um, for those who consider transitioning this into code as their job, would this wireframe be helpful for you? And I don't want you to be nice just because I'm presenting. Anybody? Yeah, absolutely. Would, it would be helpful? Yes, absolutely. Anybody think that this is, go for it. More measurements. Nice. Mm -hmm. so, the, so this is not particularly helpful for Ben's particular workflow. For some of your developers who are using something like WordPress um, or some specific formulaic uh, framework of some kind, the measurements between columns are already set in stone. And you can bend them, sure. but there's a lot less mathematics that needs to be in place. So for Ben's particular workflow, he requires measurements. So ask your developer what they require. So let's do some measurements in here. Cool. So I'm going to grab my line tool, which I can use by holding down C. And with my smart guide selected, it's now going to intelligently end the line where I'd like. And again, it's going in shared layers. Stop that. We'll go ahead and hit the edit button on that layer one so it stops doing that. Neat. So there's my line, and I'm going to go ahead and add this particular line arrow. Can you guys see that on the projector? Can I zoom in? Ooh. ooh. Nice arrow, huh? And let's go ahead and add it to the bottom as well. Neat. So now that we're zoomed in, and now that I've got this guy selected, I'm going to grab my type tool. I'm going to say, hey, this is 150 pickles. Pickles, technical term. And I've run out of space. But uh, yeah, you get the idea. So then I can go ahead and place this. No, not you. There we go. And I can also alter the color of this so it better suits the development. Let's choose a nice silver. <laughs> well, that blends right in with the wireframe. Perfect. Yeah. Neat. So if one wanted to add measurements to your document, you can totally do that and add something like this. So now you can see it working more as a blueprint application. Would that be more beneficial for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. 
Um, yeah, so that's OmniGraffle in a nutshell. Anybody have any more questions before I move on? How much is it? OmniGraffle, it was a, it's 100 bucks one time. At least it was when I got it. Yeah. The program that you use, are you, could, it, could you flip between pixels and percentages? And the, as far as size and things like that? Yeah, for measurement, for CSS. Well, it's a vector application, right. and so to a certain degree that's independent, but right. it's actually designed where you can like right click and get the CSS from a specific object, right? Okay. and it goes any degree you want. You know, you can specify what attributes you want exported and things like that. So you can do a font declaration, borders, padding, margin, like the whole so nine like yards. It takes a whole selector and then you press on your What tool is that? Sketch. Sketch. Oh, Sketch. 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 I haven't checked it out myself yet. Yeah. <laughs> we were posting about it on the Facebook group. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, I love it. It's, it's the only challenge is that other people who are wanting to use the files, then you got to export it in some format that they can access. But I've actually started to use a few services like um, Layer Vault, which you can put your your sketch files into, and then it sort of explodes it a little bit, so a developer can go and get a specific asset, like if they need the logo or they need a button that you've created. They can go and grab the, just that piece out of the file without having it themselves. So the workflow is to do this sort of stuff and carry it all the way through and getting really robust. Cool. Yeah. Like Photoshop like layers. Yeah, but Photoshop so as, far as, the, as far as the graphics, grabbing graphics from that. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. so like you don't have to have Photoshop to get the, the components up. <laughs> just use their, use their service. It means your developers are trying to open up your Photoshop files. <laughs> 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 All right, so moving on, uh, let's talk about some design. Wireframes are totally cool, but getting into more of the design stuff, that's way more fun. So when discussing and conversing with a client for the first time, there are two questions I like to ask, um, and they're kind of cool because they're a little bit riddly. Um, but the first question I like to ask is, what mood do you want your website to evoke? And that's a subtle question. As designers, what question am I actually asking? What answer am I actually looking for? Colors. Colors. I want to know what colors I want to make the website. So colors are, of course, as designers, the tools we use to evoke a particular emotional response. So if I, by asking what mood do you want your website to evoke, I'm asking them to tell me what emotional response they want their website to have. And that guides me to the correct color palette. So with that in mind, this is a quick demonstration of how colors can evoke specific emotional responses. And this is a very brief demonstration. The psychology of color is huge and deep and can't be summed up in a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but this is just an overall representation of how particular colors can bend and alter the mood or theme a website presents. Uh, also note that the projector isn't doing a great job of uh, emitting these colors, but those are all pretty standard colors. It's red, orange. Uh, Yellow, green, the sort. Cool. Um, has anybody, I love talking about this stuff, has anybody had their client say to them before they want to have a warm website? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Raise your hands, how many? Cool. And how many of you guys have ever had a client say they want to have a cold website? <laughs> so right off the bat, they're eliminating half the color spectrum. This is also culturally dependent. Uh, so when Tina, uh, Tina and I were working on the Wimp Gives project, which was law specific to Hispanics, uh, this color palette was no longer relevant and was eliminated. So keep that in mind. Do your research when uh, looking up at your audience. What and uh, color palette was? I, it's, it's culturally specific. I don't have like a quick answer for you, unfortunately. Um, uh, yeah, just do your research and confirm that everything works. So the other question I like to ask, and this one's a little trickier, is what's the industry? Now, I'm probably not going to ask the uh, client this. This probably comes either by listening to them talk or whatever research you're doing. But again, what question am I actually looking for an answer to? Anyone? This is a cool Target one. Audience. Target audience? Uh, sure. That wasn't the specific one I was looking for, but that's, that's a good question. Uh, Fonts, absolutely. Good job, Gabor. You, you programmer, you. No, you posted a sneak peek. Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think this though, this particular workflow works really well for uh, programmers because it's a very structured response to design, um, which is something I very much appreciate. Um, yeah. So the actual question is, what typography should I be 
considering for this particular project. So light colors type has its particular classes, um, and they're specific to industry. So let's talk about those. The first one I want to talk about is the class humanist. And this is sort of an older one, but the basic idea is that it emulates calligraphy. I'm sorry? Sorry, I love this one. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> is that it emulates calligraphy and has contrasting strokes, and it's typically deemed as classical and traditional, and is great for journalism and historical applications. Uh, this particular one is Garamond. Next up is tra transitional, which has more contrasting strokes than the previous, and a sharper serif. Uh, instead of being round, they're sort of like chopped off like scissors. And they're considered strong, stylish, and dynamic, and great for traditional academia and legal applications. Next up is modern. Is that, was that Gaudi, your transitional one? What was that? That's Baskerville. That's like the original right. transitional okay. font made in the uh, late 1700s. Um, next up is modern. Uh, this particular one is Dito, and it has super high contrasty strokes with a thin horizontal serif. And it's structured, clear, and elegant and great for arts and cultural applications. Lots of magazines like to use Dito. Uh, next up is Egyptian, also referred to as slab serif, and it's super low contrasty strokes with a heavy boxy serif, which is the opposite of modern. And it's considered ortho or authoritative, yet friendly, hmm. and great for marketing and promotional applications. On the flip side of serifs, we have our sans serif fonts. So this is the humanist version, uh, the sans serif version of humanist, and while sans serif fonts are a little bit more difficult to tell, uh, mostly because they're a lot more modern, um, this particular one is a humanist font. This is Myriad Pro, also Apple's default font. Uh, it has contrasting strokes that are much more minimal than the serif counterpart, but it also emulates type uh, calligraphy. And this particular one says tension between perfect and imperfect. This particular section of the lecture was lifted from codeschool.com. So I think that's a little ambiguous, but the idea is it's not quite computer and it's not quite uh, it's not quite handwritten so it's somewhere in between and it's great for government or education applications so next up is transitional anybody guess that font Helvetica. Helvetica yeah yeah that's the classic here it's easily to, easy to tell Helvetica because all the endpoints are on 90 degrees um, it has strong strokes and it's upright uniform characters and it's unassuming and modern. Helvetica is, of course, known for being the most unmooded uh, font of all time. If you want to evoke no mood, use Helvetica. <laughs> um, and it's great for technology or transportation applications. Uh, New York Subway famously uses Helvetica. Mm -hmm. Did they change it recently? Is that a thing? Mm -hmm. nah. <laughs> and then last up is geometric, which uses shapes from the backbones of the letters. You can see here I've circled some stuff for you. And it's not great on projector, but you can see how it's based on uh, geometric shapes. And then it's strict, objective, and universal, and great for science or architectural applications. So, so that's a quick demonstration of fonts. Note that we're not talking about all the fonts. We're not going to review script. We're not going to view Gothic, um, things like that in the sort. These are the ones that are relevant to web development. General rule of thumb states that you don't choose two fonts of the same style as in serif and serif. This is a humanist serif versus slab serif. So they're they're too ambiguous to be able to tell a significant difference between them. The I would be confused between header and body font. But on the flip side, do consider using two fonts within the same class, as in humanist serifs, serif versus humanist sans serif. So consider. Overall, the goal is to strive for contrast over harmony, a good rule to follow when searching for typefaces to use alongside each other. Keep it exactly the same or change it a lot. In this presentation, if I go to the next slide, uh, you can see the header uses open sounds condensed, or the body text is just open sounds. So if you're limited or not fully confident in font pairing, consider staying within the same family. So let's talk about body copy. So there isn't a golden rule for body copy, but most designers consider uh, good body copy between 16 and 26 pixels. And you're going to think that, hey, 26 pixel fonts on the uh, 16-point fonts on the web, that's, that's significant. That's big, and it kind of is. Um, also know that this does, uh, in fact, depend on the font. The size and weight of fonts are not dependent on Adobe or any large corporation. It's dependent on the font manufacturer. So things should be adjusted for each font. So now that we're assuming our body font is 16 points, you can then base the rest of your typography size on that body font. So our headline text is 300% of body, of body text, or 
48 point in this case if our original is 16. And then our subheader is going to be 150% of that, or 24. And on the same side, we've got letting. Good letting is considered between 120%, 150%, but again, it's the same dynamic that it depends on the font. You will want to play with it just to make sure it all looks good. For the most part, if you were to pick a random one between those two percentages, it's going to look good. Is that one? Oh, letting, sorry, uh, letting is the spacing between the lines. So if I were to point out, do I have a cursor? Yeah. So that's the spacing in here. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you asked. Nate. Yeah. Really, when they talk about a letting, though, they go from baseline to baseline? Yeah. Right. yeah. Sure. You sure. Know. You're mm -hmm. actually like putting let in between the. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good, Good, Good clarification. So the. Other myth that I hear from time to time is that serif fonts are better for print and sans serif fonts are better for web. And perhaps that used to be the case, but not anymore. It's not a big deal anymore. Feel free to mix them up. So with all this in mind, and I know we covered a lot of facts, with all this in mind, um, we're going to be running through some style tiles. And we're going to make one while, uh, while we're here. And I'm going to need you guys' help. Um, but with all that in mind, let's go ahead and apply these rules and guidelines and create something together that you can then use on your future projects. So let's open up Photoshop. Cool. So this is a style tile. Now the concept here is to manufacture a theme or mood to a website quickly and dependably. The idea is to make more than one style tile. They come in power. Uh, the power increases when you create more of them. So the goal here is to create three. And each style tile is going to look different. And the idea is that after we're all done, we can show the style tiles to our client. And the client can say, hey, you know, I really like the font from style tile number one, but I like the colors from style tile number three. And that's a totally admirable response. You can then create a new style tile based on that feedback. So with this in mind, let's go ahead and create some stuff. We're going to use the same client. Uh, so let's go ahead and place our logo in there. Logo. And let's stick it up here at the top. And we'll make that white so it's legible. Cool. So this particular guy, his name is Tony Chu. What would be an appropriate font to work with Tony Chu? We're sort of in between transitional and humanist. We're sort, um, transitional dedicates more to academia. Uh, so I think that's probably a good direction to go for him. So let's go ahead and try out something. Our original example was Baskerville. So let's throw that in there. And that looks pretty decent. On the flip side, we had our humanist Garmond. And I'm going to go ahead and use Adobe Garmond. It's not the same thing as the original Garmond. It's sort of Adobe's remix of it. Uh, but I think it does look better, and it's more um, universal. And either one of those look great. I think Garmond looks a little bit better and, is, uh, and suits nicely. So let's use that one. So we have our subhead. Let's make that Garmond as well. In our body copy in here. It's currently Helvetica. That's totally fine. In the next style tile, I may make it something else just to be a little bit different. But our body text is currently 16. So I want to make sure that our header text is, in fact, 48, which is three times. I have a quick question. Yeah, what's up? Do you ever take into account the fonts they've used for their logo yeah. or other sure. things? Yeah, abs like, absolutely. That's maybe something they've already gone through a process of what they do or don't like. Yeah, absolutely. So this particular workflow is dedicated to a client that doesn't have a lot of branding mm -hmm. already. But with the logo font in mind, it's not. there's no rule that says you have to use the logo font. But totally take it into consideration. So if you have that font available, throw it into one of your style tiles and see if that admirably fits. Um, there Maybe are, they only liked it in the logo? 
Well, it's, it's also not unusual to see logos that just use terrible fonts anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure we've all worked with that client. So, but yeah, totally consider. Cool. So now we've got our fonts in place. Let's pick out some colors. So he does dentistry consulting. He's an oral surgery consultant. What are some good adjectives or descriptions that you would throw at this client to best suit his audience? How would you want to present him? Safe. Safe, OK. Trust, calming. Reliable. Safe, trust, calming, reliable. clean, mm -hmm. reliable. Precise. 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 <laughs> Affordable. <laughs> cool. This is great. Uh, th this is totally great. Cool. So we have safe, trust, calming, clean, reliable, and professional. So you may want to refer back to your color uh, theory and go through the list and see which of these adjectives best are represented by certain colors. This particular list is screaming blue at me. Blue is reliable, it's calming, and I think it's a good direction to go. It's the direction I went, you can tell by the logo. So all of you guys are on the right path. So let's go ahead and pick out a blue or a palette that uses blue as our base. So in this instance, one might go to Cooler, Adobe Cooler. I would like to bypass that particular step. Um, it's a step that involves a bit of finagling and a bit of uh, playing around to get something right. Instead, I'm going to go to Color, Lovers.com, UK. And I'm going to find a color palette that somebody's already made. And that's going to be using blue as a base. So in the search, I'm going to go ahead and find something that I think is relevant to this particular company. So I'm going to type in, I don't know, maybe dentist. You can see I've done this before. <laughs> and I'm scanning through. And I am looking, I am keeping blue in mind. I'm not really digging a lot of these. This has blue, but Dentist Revenge doesn't sound all that great. <laughs> <laughs> who, picked, who picked the red color palette for the dentist? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go to, go to a nice. dentist with wet red walls. Great idea. So these aren't really applying to me. So let's try a consultant. Oh, yeah. Consultat. This is better, but I'm still not loving it. So let's be a little bit more specific and let's state, hey, for Hughes, let's go ahead and search for a blue. Better. OK. Now we're getting somewhere. So for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and pick one off of this list. Anybody have a favorite? Consulting business. Consulting business? Either of those. Either of these two? Let's use this one. All right. Consult me. Consult me. <laughs> you have been chosen. I'm just going to take a quick screenshot of that, and we'll go ahead and paste it into our style file. Cool. So we've got it in here. Let's incorporate that into the possible colors up here. Get out of the way. Got those in there, don't need that anymore. And it's starting to come along. Let's go ahead and change the color up here. I love changing the color of this thing. It makes so much difference. So let's play around here. I do want to stick to that blue. Uh, this is a little purpley on my screen, so the projector may tint these colors a little bit. But let's see if we can bend it up there. How's that look? That look better? Oh, that one looks nice. Cool. Nice, so it's coming along. Let's go ahead and change our sample header. Oh, would this dark one appear? It's hard to tell. It looks a lot like black. Let's use this darker blue. Yeah. Oh, soft. Mm. Looking good. And let's try this one. Let's do a little, it's a little lighter. That looks nice. And I'm going to keep my body black. If I don't want a black, I may consider a lighter gray. But in this case, let's keep it black. The projector doesn't emulate gray very well. 
you consider colorblindness and accessibility at this state, or fully what's your that, That's a very valid question. This particular process bypasses colorblindness, which, according to all you men, is about one and a half of you right yeah. now. So it's it's eight percent somewhere in there. Um, say the question one more time. I'm sorry. Yeah. So do you take into consideration colorblindness and accessibility things like blue Color as it's header color? I would not use it because then it's going to put like that's the link color typically. Gotcha, gotcha. So, uh, and those this sorts of accessibility considerations. Sure. Um, I don't consider. Well, I do consider, but I don't think it's going to be a problem, um, specifically because I. Well, what's a better way to describe here? Uh, with the blue in mind, I'm going to make sure that my link color is going to be different enough mm -hmm. from the rest of the. Uh, how many, what's the right way? way to word this. I want to, with the blue in mind, yeah, I want to make sure that the link color is different enough from the rest of the styling. So I do have to take into account that my headers are in fact blue and adjust the link to be different enough. So good question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Cool. So we've got some colors in here. Let's go ahead and apply some keywords. And these keywords are just telling the client what emotion and what adjective this particular mood uh, insinuates. So with our blue in mind, let's go ahead and add, going back to our color theory from the beginning, we've got blue, so let's add security. Somebody earlier said calm, which is totally fitting. Let's see, blue works great with stability. Then we can also, starability, <laughs> that's something else. That's way cooler. So you can fill out the rest of the keywords. Also keep in mind your typography also has adjectives that one can use. And I want to go ahead and color these as well just to fit the theme. I'm just going to pick random ones. Cool. I and you guys, uh, yeah. Uh, using, using the phrase keywords, would uh, people get confused with mm -hmm. search terms? Ah, ah, so if that's the case, um, that means that educating the client was a missed step. So part of this process is to say, hey client, this is not a representation of your website. We are just focusing on mood. Uh, at, no, at no point are we talking about layout, that's all in wireframings. And you want to specifically state that this is just a theme you're looking for, no keywords for SEO of any kind. Any time I hear a keyword, I just go like one. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Uh, so, you were a uh, coder, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Good for you. Okay. <laughs> nice. So the last thing we have, uh, we can color in our buttons as well, but you guys get the idea. The last thing we have is possible styles. Now again, I want to refer back to Pinterest or some other image application. We are not going to be creating our own styles. We are going to be grabbing somebody else's material and throwing them in there. And I want to talk about that toward the end. Um, but we are going to go to, let's see, we got Pinterest open. And let's do, oh, that's, that's actually a pretty good one. Uh, let's do dentist website. And the idea is just to find other themes and other pieces of design that others have used in the past. We are not reinventing the wheel here. So this one pops back up again. I like this. Let's go ahead and copy this. Let's go back to our Photoshop document. Go here. Let's paste it in. Ooh. It's a bit big. Nice, there we go. So now we're saying, hey, of all the possible styles or possible patterns, I'm really digging this text on top of the image here. I think that's a cool representation of how we might want to go with your website. So now I've got one style down. What else do we like here? Anybody see anything they like? The, uh, the symbols on this flat background are pretty cool. I like this. I like this little module here. Let's go ahead and grab that. And we can clip that beneath and move it around and resize it to where we want. Where'd it go? There we go. Neat. So, and I can do that with a third one as well. The idea here is that we are not reinventing the wheel. This is, again, a rapid development workflow. And you would then save this style tile, create a second and possibly a third one, and share all of that with the client. 
It's just a quick method of seeing what the client likes and what is best suited for their particular audience. Would you print it out or would you give it to them? That's a valid question because of the wireframing <laughs> printing application earlier. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I do like printing things out. The unfortunate part about styling is that printing, as we all know, does mm -hmm. terrible things to color. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, I would, I would probably do both if I really had the opportunity. Um, but chances are emailing is the first priority. And then if the logo isn't representative enough, if the logo doesn't have their name in it, for example, I would name this particular project and make sure that it's personal to them. In this case, the logo says all I need to, so I'm just going to hide it. Then also note, I've got style tile number one up here. It's important to number your style tiles. And I think that looks decent. So we've created one style tile. We would then go back in and create two more and then send them off to the client. Anybody have any questions on this before I move on? Yeah. Do you have an example of like three that you've done so we can see the difference? Totally. Hold that thought. Anybody have any more? I have a question. Yeah. What is your position on doing black versus dark gray versus medium gray for, for uh, Line text. content? Content? I don't have one. Whatever works best. Uh, if, if the contrast is a problem that you consider great enough, then increase the body text to black. So whatever best suits that particular project. Okay. Yeah. I don't see any technical application to not use one over the other. Anybody else? Cool. It's a target audience. That, uh, I was thinking that uh, what if uh, you could make this whole thing in dark background and make everything light. Totally, mm -hmm. totally. And, uh, when I say target audience, uh, elder people sometimes oh. see better light letters on dark background. Mm -hmm. Not just a cool rock website, but uh, <laughs> if, uh, websites for elders. It's just it's better visible. Uh, and yeah. Whenever they get Kindle, they always switch to uh, white letters on dark background. All right. Yeah, it's all part of your research phase. Just make sure you know the audience well enough. Neat. So let's go over. We have some sample style tiles I want to talk about. <coughs> so again, style tiles, just to conclude, style tiles are a, speed a speedy visual development of ideas. They're great for responsive because you're no longer designing a website. You're designing a theme of a website that the programmer can then uh, support and apply to the wireframes you've built. And yeah, it's a good summary. Cool. So this same client, I've got three examples of this of uh, this client and the style tiles we went through. So this was style tile number one, which actually looks alarmingly similar to what we just made. <laughs> <laughs> it's also got there's some subtleties that the projector isn't uh, showing very well. There's a nice background here. It's kind of subtle, but if I were to show you on my screen, it'd be nice. Here's style tile number two. And this one's got a little bit more digital to it. The background is a little more pixelated in the sort. Then we've got style tile number three. And I want to talk about this one for a second. Of the three style tiles I've shown, this is by far my least favorite. So keep in mind that style tiles are quick. You're not going to love them at all times. So what I like about having the third style tile, or this particular one, which I'm referring to as the confidence builder, uh, he can look at this and say, you know, this is a little outdated. I don't love it. I like the other ones better. And that gives him the ability and opportunity mm -hmm. to say, hey, now I know what I don't like. Or now I have more confidence in the other style tiles that do look better. Note that that is a social engineering move. And you have to be prepared for the consequences, <laughs> should he like the style tile better. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So if he chooses, if he chooses, if you make a confidence builder and he chooses this one, Absolutely build style tiles four and five and bend him back in the direction you think is best suited for that audience. At the end of the day, the client who is paying you is correct, but know that he's paying you for your expert advice. This is a lesson I learned well from Nathan. Uh, as long as he's paying you for expert advice, you give him that expert advice, whether he wants to hear it or not. Mm -hmm. yeah, often, wow. often the client will not appreciate what the audience does. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. I've actually got a, to serve the audience. I've got a good demonstration of this. So we've got our three style tiles. In this particular case, uh, the, the client wasn't confident in one of them enough to, uh, to imply a confident homepage mock-up afterwards. I wanted to go further in style tiling. So I did create a fourth and fifth style tile. The, I, the fifth one ended up looking like this, uh, which sort of bent into a homepage mock-up following the wireframes we made. And the ending result ended up looking like this. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. so it looks nice. Now, I can show you examples of things that went really well, and that's great, but in all honesty, successful presentations are less interesting than failed presentations. So I'd like to walk you through a couple demonstrations of things. Um, calling it a failure would be a very generous term. Uh, well, calling it a failure would be too much. They, they, were, they were all successful, um, but there were a couple flaws in the next few that I'd like to show you that uh, I've learned from since. So this is a style tile I worked on for a law website. And oh my, that projector. Uh, it's a little bit more colorful on my side. <laughs> now, there are a couple flaws in this. Can anybody, oh, by the way, the style tile layout I was using earlier was from styletiles.es. It's, I've got it open here. It's the URL is a little funky. It's, yes. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I, if you, can, you guys can see it up there, style tool that, yes. Anyway, that's a particularly generic one that uh, you'll see from time to time. I didn't love that particular layout, and I decided I would make my own. And I do like experimenting on clients. I know that's a little bit harsh, but uh, consistently look for the modern or the, the better workflow. I really enjoy doing that. So this is a style tile layout I created. Now, can anybody find a couple flaws with this particular style tile? It, it's a little too representative of, a lay, of an actual layout. Ooh, like it, mm. that's a valid one. Hold that thought. I want to come back to that okay. statement in just a bit. Uh, anybody else? So one is, I'm missing the adjectives down below, all the descriptive mm -hmm. terms. I'm missing all the keywords. By removing the keywords, I'm asking the client to base their opinion on colorful aesthetics. I'm not asking them the objective question of solving the problem for the audience. Absolutely the wrong way to go about it. I want, in fact, having the client base their judgment on just the colors is almost the opposite of what I had intended. So absolutely key to keep the keywords in there. Another problem is the style tile number is missing. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've sent style tiles four, five, and six before to have the client say, hey, I love style tile number two. And you're like, which one? Sweet. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, but overall, it ended up really well. Here's what the website ended up, uh, or here's what the homepage mock-up ended up looking like. So it looks decent. Here's another style tile that has a couple flaws. Earlier, you mentioned layout. Here's the hero image at the top with the textual header. Absolutely a no-no. Uh, the client was unable to look past the header as a non-layout aspect and was unable to tell me what he liked or disliked about everything else. He got stuck on the header, um, which again defeated the purpose of the style tile. Also again, I forgot the uh, keywords down below, me being lazy. And then I also did not place his logo at the top. Now at the time we didn't have a logo for this particular project, but business logo is not the right alternative to that. Put his name in there, personalize it, make sure he doesn't think he's getting a random template off the block. So at least make him recognize that you're putting some effort into it. And again, I forgot the style tile number. So. I have a quick question. Um, when he saw the hero banner at the top, was he able to elaborate anymore? Or did he just dead stop right there? And it was more or less a dead stop, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Um, have you ever had the client that says, I don't know what I like, but I'll know it when, when I, I see it? it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Style tiles are a great solution to that because you're able to yeah. throw a lot at them at once. Mood boards are also a great solution to that. So clients are, they're picky. They, uh, they have a hard time describing what us designers take for granted. Uh, this style tile was number one. We then moved on to, I think this one was number four. Uh, so it definitely altered and changed throughout the original style tile. I fixed the logo, but I didn't fix uh, the keywords or the, or the style tile number. But I didn't fix the layout. And that ended up, the homepage mockup ended up looking like that. So, oh yeah, which works great on this screen. There's a, there's a nice cityscape back there. It looks great. <laughs> cool. Do you always use lower Ipsum for the big body text, or is there any value to adding content that's more relevant to them? I typically use lower Ipsum. Uh, I've, I found that when using actual content, clients will get stuck on that yeah. and say, no, I don't want to use that content there. Yeah. Just keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Um, did you have, there is another one beside Lorem Ipsum, and that's the block text I see from time to time. Has anybody had any experience using that? I love it. You, you like it? That's what you yeah. use? Yeah, it's basically just a gray line. ...of the text without getting into actual text. And 
it's very much a stylistic sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's like the Have Facebook you thing that loads the perspective. You probably can't use that to show fonts. No, no. so it's yeah. the body copy or things like that. More yeah, wireframes that I would typically use that. Have you found that to be more beneficial than lore Ipsum? It depends on the client. Gotcha. <laughs> it depends on the application. If it's UX stuff I'm doing, then it's really handy. Because then it's not about the copy, it's about the workflow or whatever. Right on. For this sort of thing, I think it would be beneficial to have text. All right, cool. Did anybody have any questions on style tiles? Differed from the the cookie cutter one from the website that you've done yourself that was highly successful for you. Uh, I They've all been successful. So to say that one was like super successful in the rest. Uh, Do you have one that's word. become your template? The the last one that I showed you a second ago is the one I typically use. This particular layout. Mm. But with keywords. Right, but with keywords. <laughs> and sales on there. And style time later. <laughs> Shut up, guys. I learned my lesson. <laughs> cool. So one thing that's kind of cool about using style tiles and wireframes as your base is that they are technically interchangeable. If you wanted to use style tiles before wireframes, you can do so. However, can anybody name me a reason why you may want to consider doing wireframes before style tiling? Yeah. Responsive. Responsive. Absolutely. Totally great idea. Uh, any other ones? Mm, I don't know if it's faster. Can you, any ideas there? Um, just because it's less for them to consider almost. So they're not looking at like, well, the colors and the typography and the imagery and all the ways it's portraying their message. It's just about where things live on the page. So it's quicker to get them to sign off and say, okay, I'm on board, let's move forward with the project where this, they could get stuck for longer and start to lose confidence in your process. I think that okay. mm. I hear a little bit of what you're saying, like maybe it's more in their expertise to see the wireframe and go, oh yeah, I've got three main services. That's kind of where they're proficient in knowing their business, whereas when they're looking at colors and what have you, they might just be like, stein yeah, maybe yeah. that looks good. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, more cool, cool. Uh, the main one that I was looking for was if you do wireframes first, you can then pass on those wireframes to your programmer and keep the entire busy, the entire team busy at the same time. For many of you who doesn't have a programmer or do all the stuff yourself, that may not apply. But if you are working on a team, passing the wireframes on to your programmer so we can start developing the layout first does make the process go more quickly. Do you have a website that you can recommend that would have different examples of kind of older versus newer, kind of the transition of design principle in style, mm -hmm. style files, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe huh. correlating a little bit with industry? I don't. Anybody have an educated answer there? Interest. Just a bad website. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep an eye out for one, though. That'd be interesting just to see. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You never, you know, when you're so we'll busy in the grind, machine. you don't necessarily know what the latest design trend is. You totally. Know, Keeping up so is... so nice just to see kind of new mock-ups with new designs. Mm -hmm. Totally. Keeping yeah. up is a, practically a full-time oh, job. Yeah. Well, sorry, I mean, modern stuff, you, know, you just, like, Google uh, Word, WordPress inspiration, and, and you, you can see people's mock-ups of sites, and that's what I do. You know, yeah. Kind of and they release that the top 2014. Yeah. You know, there's also situations out there okay. where you go, oh, this is. How far back does uh, awards go? Oh. A W W W. How far back do they go? Anybody know? Nineties. Really? Yeah. Mm. Okay, that might be beneficial. See what the awards were from ten years ago. Yeah, I was gonna say it depends on the time frame you're looking at. But if you're looking for like what the Uber geeks are designing right now, Dribble D R I B B B L E dot com is basically like where the designers go to show off for each other. Mm. And so if you do even like mock-up or homepage mock-up in there, you can kind of get <coughs> the gestalt of the, of the current trends. Obviously, it's going to be very current, but that's sort of a way to see what's on the cutting edge right now. What are these guys playing around with in their spare time, or what are the projects that they're excited to show? Mm -hmm. so, Neat. Interesting to say. Cool. Nate, yeah. at what point um, do you usually get content from clients? 
<laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Yes, <laughs> <recently>. <laughs> Uh, no, it's, it myself, it's a valid question, and it changes for every client you work on. Uh, I would love to say that I would get co content before the website starts, but we all know that that's simply never going to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in our case, in our in our case, you learn nothing. <laughs> in our case, we hire a content it, it, developer. It obviously depends on the client and what industry they're in, but if you push them towards it being a requirement, so to speak, before you get started. I mean, have you right. tried it? Have you tried that? Yeah, absolutely. That was what UXL was all about. Yeah. Um, the concept of getting content before everything else, while grand and awesome in theory, it's just not going to happen. And you are not going to be able to stay in business if you wait for your client to get you content. You're just not going to be able to do it. The solution there is to, uh, we have a content writer on staff, the solution there is to get a content writer to write them for you. Mm -hmm. And tell that to your client, hey, if you're not going to get me content, I'm going to bill you for the content writer. And they're going to communicate with you directly, but know your bill is increasing. So, how do you know how to lay out the design of the content? Uh, That's where style tiles come in place. Nothing here is relevant on content. Yeah, but like with the wireframing, uh, if you, I mean, you're basically then developing content to fill in a wireframe. Totally, it's it's not a perfect solution, unfortunately. You're sort of designing wireframes based on assumed content, which isn't the greatest solution. So. It's a, a problem that the mid-range client will always have. Yeah. yeah, it's really a question of cost. Because that's what I always try to do. It's okay, do you need that discovery process in which you can discover what's your business strategy, what services do you have? Because a lot of people just can't articulate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they need that support to write it. That's where a content writer will come in. Or a business strategist to say, what are you trying to do? Who's your audience? What are you trying to sell? But once you answer those questions, then there's some more general business structure that you put in. And you can kind of see it, like on an author's website, there's this block, and then there's this block, and there's that. On an e-commerce, there's the sales page on top. And there's sort of patterns that you can start to see depending on the industry. And then you can lead them that way with the wireframe. Cool. Yeah, that's the awesome problem. Uh, so we're almost, we're almost finished. Let's go ahead and start wrapping up. So with all of these in mind, with wireframes and style tiles in mind, uh, know that this is not the only workflow available. There are plenty more out there. Um, our local engine is Red. Uh, they're sort of known for the grandiose, large-scale websites. Um, I don't know if they do style tiling, but I do know that they do, instead of having three style tiles, they also have three homepage mockups made by three different designers. And that's sort of a solution that probably all of us here don't have the overhead for. But know that what we're discussing, this rapid development, style tiling, wireframing workflow, it's not the only one. And there may be other solutions that are better equipped for your particular situation. There's also a movement toward Photoshop list design. I was looking at an application for Dropbox down in San Francisco a while back. And I wasn't looking for a job. I have a great job. But, uh, I was interested in seeing what they required for a web designer. And Photoshop expertise was not one of the ones listed. What they did require expertise in was OmniGraffle. Mm -hmm. So food for thought there. They specifically stated in their application they were moving toward a Photoshop list design movement. Now, I don't know what that means for now or in the long run, um, but know that it's, uh, it's something, that is, that something that might be coming. Mm -hmm. And on a similar note, uh, this particular application is called Macaw. Um, there are, it's not a unique idea, it's basically a WYSIWYG editor. You can design all your stuff in Photoshop, more or less, and it spits out code for you. Um, it's not a unique idea, it was trendy 10 years ago and it sort of died down and now it's trendy again. Um, but it's just another solution that may influence us in, in the coming years. If you want to continue, we're all intellects here, I know you're taking away on your Monday night to uh, come learn. If you're interested in continuing education, uh, Lynda.com, Code School, and Treehouse are all three sources I've uses, used. Lynda, by far, the best of all of those three. Um, Code School is great if you're wanting to learn some basic design. They do have a couple design courses, but it's, as suggested, mostly code. Um, but Lynda.com is out, is just, it's uncomparable to the amount of content they have. Yeah. They're absolutely phenomenal. And if you want to learn more Photoshop specifically, here at the local JC, <laughs> a gentleman named Donald Laird teaches Photoshop, and this guy lives and breathes Photoshop. Um, he is, the vast majority of my Photoshop knowledge comes from this guy. And I highly recommend his courses. I, was, I have a quick question. Yeah. You were talking about a, a Photoshop-less 
I, I don't understand how they would get their content, you know, mm -hmm. to a final, you know, custom look. Sure, sure. Uh, earlier so we were talking about style tiling. Right, and they're only talking about that, but not final design, like doing some high end. Well, let me let me ask you this. What is to say that I can't give a wireframe to a programmer and a style tile to a programmer and say that the website's mm -hmm. done? Yeah. What's to say that he can't go all the rest of the way and not having to create a homepage mock-up? There's nothing to really stop that from happening except the client who wants to see a homepage. No, not at that stage, but I'm talking about when you want to get customized, you know, a, a custom look at, for the actual graphics that are going to go on the final side. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Final, final. Yeah, I don't know if there is a solution to a Photoshopless design. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. I was like, wow. How are they going to do that? Yeah, so yeah. it's not uh, something I'm fully knowledgeable in or even educated in. Is that a in. in Macaw where it's been the full homepage mockup in Macaw yeah. that the client sees and signs off on and goes to uh, development from there? Um, so that's it's a fair alternative. My, our designer. Yeah, I mean, it's not Photoshop. It's, it's still design. Yeah, you can't <laughs> get to that granular level, though, you know, like that. Like I agree. Creativity. Yeah. I very much agree. <coughs> <coughs> Does anybody have any closing, any, any thoughts or any questions before I go ahead and wrap up? I do have some closing thoughts, but I want to grab questions first. Yeah, do you, do you ever have clients get hung up on the layout of the wireframe, like they would get hung for mm -hmm. and or the mock-up? Because I pretty much stopped doing mock-ups because I couldn't get clients to understand that it wasn't always going to be pixel perfect, like yeah. screens are different yeah. sizes, and mm. especially if you want something that's remotely responsive, you know, I had clients saying, well, but when I look at it on my screen, the bars on the sides are wider than what you showed me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not like it gets bigger and smaller, you know, it's, <laughs> so totally. anyway, do you have clients that get hung up on, that get attached to the layout of either the, of the wireframe or the mock-up and how do you how do you have that conversation how do you Sure. Um, the quick, the quick answer is no. Uh, specifically because wireframes, I very much encourage you to print out. So the ambiguity of having the bars not fitting the resolution of the screen doesn't really come into play. As as uh, it doesn't it just doesn't come into play. Um, whether someone gets stuck up on the wireframes, I don't have a good experience example of saying this is how I got past that project. Page, like they go, okay, so this is what it would look like in a browser on my desktop or whatever. But then if they're they, do they not understand that that's not what it's going to look like on their phone or a tablet or? So if we get to like the homepage mockup, for example, yeah. and they sh they view that on the browser, at that point I would bring them into the if if you're able to bring them into the office and and explain them right there. At that point, it just becomes educating the clients. Mm -hmm. And yeah. mm -hmm. it just boils down to client versus client and see which was more able to understand that particular so problem. I, I did, well, it's now been probably a year since I did, but I did a, a website where I provided style tiles, got approval on a style tile, and basically just jumped right into the browser. Like, I didn't even bother with a mock-up. Sure. And mm -hmm. they were fine with that. And, you know, it, it worked like really you. well. Mm -hmm. um, but it might not work really well every client the same way. Mm -hmm. Totally. It depends. If you think they're very confident on the last style tile, then feel free to dive right in. Um, I like to take a little bit more cautious route, mm -hmm. um, but it's totally dependent on your uh, on your workflow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just wanted to actually add one thing to that. Actually, um, your solution to around that actually is uh, becoming fairly common that I'm seeing, at least just within my company, like you, we're, we're over 100 employees worldwide, you know, a bunch of designers, we're mostly engineering staff, but um, we've been doing a lot of um, designing, and we have a number of clients mm. that um, that, have, that have had similar kind of difficulties of like not being able to picture how a static image can translate into something that they can actually interact with and, and get a true feel of the design. Like, you know, go, you go down the scenario, like you design this, they approve it, and then they actually start playing with it and start realizing, like, actually, I don't like that anymore. Mm -hmm. You're having to backtrack all over again. Uh, and something that we've started, well, we've been doing it for a little while, but it takes a certain skill set to a degree is doing in-browser design, essentially, uh, mm -hmm. such as that. So, you know, we normally have uh, a designer or somebody that's labeled as, like, a front-end engineer, for example, um, that would be handling those kind of things, like, we'll do wireframes, um, 
I don't know of anybody that's actually doing style tiling. Uh, too bad Ben Grace is in here. He's a coworker of mine, another really awesome designer is Nate, um, that uh, would probably be able to vouch more for that. But I know that would do a lot of wireframes, and then we'll hand those off to a front end engineer to actually quickly go mock up everything in code mm -hmm. with minimal effort uh, and be able to produce something that works across multiple different screens and whatnot. And that, that's been really successful. Do you keep that wireframe simple, or is it like a high-fidelity mock-up? High-fidelity. Um, so like there'll be a, a bit of design, you know, like it'll involve some colors and uh, layout primarily. Uh, and then from there, you know, like as long as they can approve the overall structure and look and feel of things, then we can take that further into something a little bit more granular. So, hmm. something along the way there. Hey there, cool. Hello, way in the back. Do you have any Design resources. Sure. Like right now, I just bookmark websites I like. Totally. That's kind of clunky, and sometimes the websites change, and the design isn't there anymore. You know, it's something different. Um, so, do you have something that's of interest? I mean, I don't know. Is there a resource out there that helps you collect different parts that you can refer to later? Yeah, it's, it's again coming back to staying up to date, which is really hard to do. Uh, there are a couple of sources that I like to use, one of which, which is still unbelievably around, is RSS. Uh, you can subscribe to an RSS feed and gather all the design resources you want and have your daily newsletter. Um, that is something I totally enjoy. I use one called Feedly. Uh, another application that I really like, I'm going to get some groans here for those who are familiar, but Reddit is a great educational tool for this particular purpose. Subscribe to all the design Reddits, and that's a great way of content diversity and content uh, filtering, public filtering, to highly rate good quality links and downgrade the other ones. Downgrade? <coughs> we got it. Anybody else have any sources they want to add on to that? Oh, I know. You just found about archive, no. Archive.org, and in that is a Wayback Machine. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And Love you can look machine. and if you were, someone was talking about what designs used to look like, you can go back and look at the web, like when it first started and through the years, and you can see how a website evolved and even just. Sure. Yeah, there's also browser tools which allow you to take like a full screenshot. Right. Mm -hmm. So it'll take the full thing. It just saves it as an image. You can drop yeah. that in Dropbox. I usually just use Dropbox. Then you can put whatever art folder structure you want. And then it's just got a web interface too. And that way it's a quick way to just drop it in. But there's tools that allow you to tag them and all kinds of things like that. Going uh, one step further on it, there's a, a website in particular that you like for some of its uh, either functionality or some of its swizziness that really can't be captured in a screenshot or somewhere. You can actually save a whole entire web page or website mm -hmm. using a, a website slogan to the like. yeah. And that, that can be really helpful. We actually will do that on a lot of projects. We'll, we'll grab a whole entire site slurp before we start building the new one. That way we can go back and kind of look at what we had and you know, show how we made different Anybody have any experience using Evernote for this product for this problem? Yeah, how's, how, has it been a good solution for you? I like it. Yeah, I haven't been using them, but I've been clipping a lot, so I need to go and visit. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start closing up. I've got a. It said that if you want us to give a lecture that the thing that's most memorable is the closing statement. If there's a particular grand finale, finale point you'd like to address, it's to be done in the conclusion. So I'd like to take this moment and leave you with some food for thought. And I don't particularly know how well I can articulate this, so bear with me for just a moment. The concept of plagiarism through graphic designers seems to be thrown around <laughs> relatively regularly. But it would be absolutely wrong of me and hypocritically of me to say in the same breath that I've demonstrated stealing as a tool to be angry that somebody would steal from me. Uh, so I encourage you to realize that, and it's not full plagiarism, I'm not taking somebody else's material and stealing it as my own, but I'm also not reinventing the wheel. It would be a stretch to say what we've done would be considered innovative. So I encourage you to understand the underlying complement of somebody 
borrowing pieces of your material mm -hmm. and accept it as a symptom of the design community. And instead of getting angry about it or closing yourself off from the web, instead become involved and make yourself more known. Uh, become a part of the discussion, join a community, post on a forum or, or do, a, do a lecture here at WIMP. I mean, it's, there's so many ways for you to get more involved rather than getting angry of the career path that you've chosen. So, um, Anyway, food for thought. Uh, that's something that many designers disagree with me on, so feel free to be one of those. And uh, thank you all so much for coming out and listening to me talk. I'll be sticking around if anybody has any personal questions. Are you going to make the, your slides available? Uh, it's all recorded. Oh, okay. Oh, oh it, it's, it's also, uh, they're capturing my desktop as well.